Hi, and welcome to today's video. Now, I've been called many things over the years, and that happens when you're a teacher. And many of those things, well, I'd rather not think about. But one of those things is cheap. Well, I would prefer to think of myself as thrifty or practical. It sounds a lot better. But the reality is that I would much rather repair something that I already own than to go out and buy a new one. And that's a little bit what the home machining thing is all about. And one of the things that I've been working on is my old lawnmower. I've had it for about eight years and I haven't given it a lot of love, so it needs some work. And what I want to do now is repair the wheels on it. Now, lawnmower wheel repair really isn't very important, but it is an excuse to see certain techniques and who knows, maybe learn something. So let's take a look at what I need to do here. What I want to do here is turn these wheel pins that are quite worn, turn them down to something that gives them a nice diameter, something I can work with, and then I'm going to press on a brass sleeve that I'm going to produce from this brass bar. Now I'm going to turn it down to a diameter that I can ream at quite accurately and not too small as to weaken the wheel. After that, I'm going to have to enlarge the bore on the wheel itself to accept the pin that's going to be a little larger now after I press on a brass sleeve. And that's fine because they're quite worn also and by opening them up I'll get them nice and parallel again. I'm going to be doing that with this drill but that would be quite dangerous. So I'm going to modify the drill so I can drill this plastic bore easily. So let's get our safety glasses on and let's get to work. There's two things that makes the drilling of this hole dangerous. And the first is, well, that the hole already exists. And if I use this twist drill to come and drill the hole, well, the chisel end or edge of this twist drill won't meet any material or has nothing to push against. And that's very dangerous. Now, you may not know what a chisel point is. I'd like to say that isn't important, but if you are drilling and you don't understand the twist drill geometry, well, you're going to get yourself into trouble. So, here's a video that can help you out with that. But if I simplify things, well, I can say that if the chisel edge doesn't meet material, there is no back pressure, and that means that this twist drill can easily become a tap and basically thread itself inside the hole. The second thing that makes this dangerous is the material itself. This is a very soft plastic and that means that there's very little resistance to compression and that means again that this twist drill can easily thread itself into it because as in the first case we're not making or producing a hole we're just making it a little bigger. We don't want this twist drill to become a tap. So what can we do? Well, we have two options. We can use a straight flute drill, and that, well, in itself resolves all this dilemma. Or we can modify this twist drill by producing two small flats on its cutting lips so that it acts like a straight flute drill. So let's take a look at how to do that on our pedestal grinder. What I want to do here is produce a small flat on each of the cutting lips and I'm going to do that on this grinding wheel by positioning the part to produce a flat that's going to be about uh, parallel with the axis of the drill. Now I can drill to my heart's content because I've seriously reduced the risk of this twist drill grabbing the part. Well, 
now we're ready to start on the shafts themselves or the pins or whatever you want to call these things that hold the wheel onto the lawnmower. I'm going to want to turn this center diameter that's quite worn. I want to turn it so that it's nice, even, and parallel and an accurate diameter because the sleeve that I'm going to put on there is going to be a press fit, so things have to be quite accurate. And for that, well, I don't have much choice. I'm going to have to hold it by the hex at the end. And you can see that this hex really isn't very long. And that just won't be enough to hold it there for this turning operation. It won't be accurate. So what I want to do is produce a center hole on the end to support it. And with a center, not with the hole, but with the center in the hole. And that's going to give me the stability that I need to turn this diameter. But again, if I hold it just by the hex to center drill, that's going to be wobbly and inaccurate. So what I want to do here is to hold it by this main diameter. Now luckily, my three-jaw chuck is small enough and the jaws are short enough so that I can insert this right into the three-jaw chuck so that the hex clears the back end of the jaws and then clamp down and hold it just by the center. Should your chuck be too large, let's say you can't do that. Well, remember, you can produce a split sleeve. So you just turn a sleeve that's slightly larger than the hex, because that's your problem here, uh, and bore it so that this fits more or less snug. It doesn't have to be tight at all. And then split the sleeve on one side lengthwise so that it remains into one piece but has a little flexibility to it. Put your part into there and then hold the sleeve and the part in your three jaw and you can come and work on the end of the part. That's a good trick that will get you out of trouble sometimes when working on parts that have different diameters. So let's take a look at the center drilling operation. So I'm going to want to turn my diameter and for that I'm going to want to hold it by the hex with my three jaw chuck. Now the three jaw won't center things perfectly but hey it's a lawn mower so it doesn't have to be perfect here. But I do want it to be aligned with my center so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold it by about half the width of the hex and just tighten it down slightly. Then I'm going to insert my center in the center hole and push on this pin with the tailstock. And that's going to push the pin into the three jaw chuck because it's just slightly tight. And as I'm pushing it in, I'm going to tighten down the three jaw chuck. And I'm going to continue to push it in until I get just flush or just barely flush with the inside surface of the hex because I want to be able to turn the diameter right to that hex. Then I'll just tighten down my center, the tailstock, and I'll be good to go. Now I'm going to turn this down to 7 16 Why? Well, because I have a 7 16 reamer, and 7 16 is just slightly smaller than what it already is, so it won't weaken things very much. Uh, 7 16 is 0.3 uh, 0.4375, sorry. So 0.4375, and that means that I'm going to be turning this to about 0 0.4378. 4377, 4378, somewhere around there. And then with a very fine file, I'm just going to come and adjust it to get that light press fit. So about half a thou or maybe three quarters of a thou, something like that is the press fit that I want. So, let's take a look at that.
Now I've spent what seems to be a lifetime measuring parts quite accurately. So when I'm working at home, if I can produce a part without measuring or with very few measurements, well, I have a ball doing it. And what I need to do here is to produce a brass sleeve that's going to press fit onto this part. And I can do that with very little measurement. Actually, the only thing I'm going to have to measure is the outside diameter of the bushing that I'm going to press on so that I can get my clearance fit on into the wheels. Because I'm going to want just a light clearance for the wheels to be able to turn, obviously. So, what am I going to do here? Well, first off is I have to determine how long the bushings need to be. And for that, I'm going to use a measuring tool, but I'm going to use it as a comparative tool, so I won't have to read the scale. And all I'm going to do here is position this so that I leaned up on the hex, the bottom of the hex, where the diameter that I need to bush is uh, starts, and I can set it just about, oh, about two hundred thousandths of an inch longer than what I need. I'm going to want that clearance for sawing the bushing off of the main bar once I've turned it. So that's my basic length. I'm going to want to drill and ream the hole. So I'm going to want to drill, as we can see here, just slightly deeper than the length that I've set here. So I have and when you measure the depth of the drill, I mean the parallel hole that it's going to produce. So I start on the major diameter uh, starting point, not on the tip of the drill. And if I put myself here, I can see that I've positioned a little clamp here, a hose clamp, on my drill, uh, just positioned a little bit further away from the start, start point of the major diameter than I have on my calipers. By eye, and I'm talking maybe 15 thou further away. Now, these little hold hose clamps are grand for this type of thing. You can buy stops for drills. Now, this isn't a stop. It's an indication because it's never going to touch the end of the part, but I can get quite close and know where I am. So these are great because they fit on all kinds of sizes and there's several sizes available. So with a few clamps you can do from quite small to quite large drills. Very practical. So I've set that up without measuring, just comparing to this. And once that is done, well I'm going to be using a reamer. And I want to make sure that I can ream without any problem. And I can see here that the length of the cutting teeth on my reamer here is about the same as the finished length of the part. Not the finish, but the finished, what I'm going to do here before surfacing the second end. And if I check here, I can see that, because I've planned it that way, that the hole that I'm going to produce is going to end up being even a little deeper than that. And that's great because that means that when I ream, I'm going to ream right up to where the teeth end, a little bit, a little bit past it, just barely, and that will ensure me, if I don't go any further than that, that the end of the reamer will not bottom out in the hole. And that's important because if your reamer bottoms out in the hole, well, it's going to go askew and oversize your hole. So, there we go. I'll produce all that without any actual measurements. But it all starts with two things. The surfacing of the end and producing a good center hole. So let's take a look at that.
So, there's the final product. Now, my drill has an indicator or a stop on it. My reamer is marked. I set my cross slide to zero on the last pass on this one. And that means that I could knock off a hundred of these quite quickly. But that would be just crazy. Because I only have four wheels on my lawnmower. And here's another little part that I've been working on. It's just a simple bracket with two holes in it and it's cut from a piece of angle iron. I need about 300 of these. Well, I don't need about, I need 300 of them. So I can produce about 50 an hour uh, and well that's fine because I'm in no rush. But there's nothing really special about the making of this other than I used isostatic isostatic positioning for positioning for the hole drilling. Uh, and well that is something that some novice machinists have never heard about. So if you don't know what isostatic positioning is, I'll check out the link for the video. It's quite important if you want to do anything that resembles production work. Nothing special here, so I ju I'm just going to do a montage of uh, what I did to produce the parts. Let's take a look at that. So I've completed all my parts, the wheels and the brackets, in just over five hours of work. And I saved about $200. Pretty good deal. But more important than that, I had a lot of fun doing it. And that's so important. So you, you have fun. But remember, be safe. It's so important. And happy machining. Hey, hey, hey.